Hello, and welcome to the final meeting of the Barbados Genealogy Group for 2023. Greetings to those of you on Zoom, as well as those joining us on Facebook Live. And thank you so much for taking the time to join with us today. I know you are all very busy. My name is Harriet Pierce. And I am the coordinator for the Barbados Genealogy Group a group that has been in existence since March of 2014. Today, we welcome Mrs. Linda ward Booing, who will speak on the topic, the contribution of the Ward family of Barbados to the history and development of Mount Gay Run. As the title says, this presentation will give us a glimpse into the history of the Ward family in Barbados and the contribution which the family, headed by A.F. Ward, made between 1908 and the 1990s towards making Mount Gay Rum the most famous libation in the world uh, that we know it to be today. Linda Ward Boyne, one of the St. Lucy Wards, is the granddaughter of Aubrey Fitzosbert Ward and has been a part of the famous Mount Gay Rum Empire from birth. Linda was born in 1952 at Oxford Plantation in St. Peter, next door to Mount Gay Shire Estate in St. Lucie, both owned by Fairfield and Mount Gay Company Limited, a company set up by her grandfather, A.F. Ward. She is a historian and is interested in every form or area of history. Linda is particularly a furniture historian, specializing in 18th and 19th century Eastern Caribbean furniture and the role which this played in the lives of West Indians. Linda has a BA and a master's degree in heritage studies from the University of the West Indies, Capeville. She is a practicing visual artist and has taught art and history in secondary schools over the past 50 years. Being interested in the history of everything, Linda takes great pleasure in presenting this particular topic, the contribution of the Ward family of Barbados to the history and development of Mount Gay Realm. Just before we hear from Linda, just a few uh, housekeeping matters. We want you to hold your questions until the end, and then you may type those questions in the Q&A, which you can see at the bottom of the screen. And you can, if you have any comments, please put them in the chat so that we're, it's easier to follow questions on comments. We also have the function of raising your hand. You see the function at the bottom of the screen. If you want to ask your question or make your comment on my and we will unmute you, unmute you, sorry. So over to you now, Linda. Thank you very much, Harriet. And good afternoon, everyone. And Harriet, thank you for your wonderful introduction. And thanks to the Barbados Museum and Historical Society and the Genealogy Group for asking me to present this afternoon. It is a real pleasure to be here. Every family has a history, and to that family, the history is important, interesting, and some ways, sometimes downright exciting. There is no one family history that is any more meaningful than anyone else's, although some families make it into the history books and others don't. What is there about some families which ensures that their history becomes known throughout the land or even makes it into the history books. Usually that family or some members of that family contribute to society in some way, either politically, economically, socially, or all three. In the case of the Ward family of Barbados, they did contribute in all of these ways, including two additional ways, demographically or to a significant increase in the population of Barbados, and through the development of the brand known as Mount Gay Rum. The wards are known throughout Barbados for many things. One, land ownership. Two, 
The name is synonymous with Mount Gay Rum, not only drinking it, but making it. Three, having a lot of children. Aubrey Fitzosbert had 50 plus children. His brother Edmund had 12, and the seven siblings between them had over 100 children. Also, they are known, whether true or false, for having a great deal of money. What then were the origins of this family and how did they attain their wealth and prestige over the years? Slide of the ship. The story begins with Robert Ward and James Ward, two brothers who arrived in Barbados on May 15, 1635, on board the ship plane Jane or Joan. This ship left London bound for Virginia, one of the 13 British North American colonies. The ship made a scheduled stop in Barbados and the two brothers got off, loved Barbados apparently and stayed, even though it is believed that they were originally on their way to Virginia. James was 18 years old at the time and Robert was 22. It is not confirmed that the brothers were English. They got on the ship in England, but it is thought that they were from Ireland because with or without the E, Ward is an Irish name. And also there is an area in Belfast, Ireland, a lovely area which is called Ward Park. Now, what was happening when these two brothers got off the ship in Barbados in the 1630s? Barbados had just been settled by the British in 1627, and during the dispute between the Earl of Carlisle and William Courtine over the ownership of the island, life was very, very difficult for the early settlers who were experiencing the starving time and other issues. In Britain, this was also a period of difficulty where poor people were willing to or were forced to leave England because social, economic, and political and religious conditions were so bad that it was necessary to try to improve life elsewhere. This is the environment into which Robert and James Ward would have been born. It appears that the brothers, once they reached Barbados, settled in St. Philip, in an area we now know as Penny Hall or Jenswick. The two wards who will be featured in this presentation are direct descendants of these two brothers, James and Robert, particularly Robert. And so we are now going to look at how did these, how do we go from two brothers arriving in the new world to start a new life to two brothers, their descendants? who started a new heritage, Mount Gay Rum. Next slide. It is reported that Mount Gay Rum is the oldest rum in the world and that it was first made in Barbados in 1703. It is also reported that Mount Gay Rum is the best rum in the world. These facts are undoubtedly true, but it is not these facts alone that made the history of Mount Gay Rum intriguing. It is the association of Mount Gay Rum with the Ward family, which makes an interesting story. Even though Mount Gay Rum was first made in 1703, it did not become internationally famous until after 1918, when Aubrey Fitzosbert Ward became involved in its production. It was Aubrey, the famous AF Ward, and his business partner, John Hudson, who put Mount Gay Rum on the map. And here's a photo of John Hudson and the one before the AF. This presentation examines the contribution that the Ward family has made to the development of Mount Gay Rump, as well as to the economic, historical, and cultural development of the Barbadian landscape. It confirms that the existence of this Ward family business has led to the development and international recognition of Barbados through the outstanding vision and marketing strategies of Aubrey Fitzosbert Ward, his brother Edmund, and their partner, John Hudson. How did these men do this in the early 20th century? Aubrey and Edmund seized the opportunity through thrift, prudent management of their finances, and careful planning to acquire failing sugar estates, 
at the turn of the 20th century and to transform them into lucrative self-sufficient entities. They also availed themselves of an excellent marketing manager and partner, John Hudson. They bought Sugar Estates out of Chancery, and Chancery was a legal court which, um, into which people who owed money, who had big debts, plantation owners, if they could not pay their debts, then their plantations were put into Chancery. And this was at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And from Chancery, um, those who had available money could buy the plantations at a reasonably low price. And they had to be sold because of the debts that they owed. So the Ward brothers were able to buy sugar estates out of Chancery. And they were able to take advantage of low prices and buy up a lot of property. Some of the estates bought out of Chancery by Aubrey and Edmund will be mentioned later. Some of them they bought together and some they bought separately. But before buying Mount Gay, in 1918, 18, Aubrey bought Fairfield Factory and Sugar Estate, which you see on this slide. And you can see the sugarcane fields, you can see the estate house, and you can see the factory itself. It was a small syrup factory at the time. And Aubrey managed to enlarge it and make it into a sugar factory as well as syrup and molasses. This was the first or flagship estate of the St. Lucie Wards and was bought in 1908. It was not purchased out of Chancery, but was purchased um, from the St. John family who owned it at the time. And this, of course, was the, was the beginning of the St. Lucie Ward dynasty. Mount Gay, St. Lucie, was bought in 1918, and that was bought out of Chancery, just as the First World War ended. Aubrey was encouraged to buy Mount Gay by his cousin and very good friend, Sam Ward, and Sam became the first manager of Mount Gay. In this slide that is up now, you will see not Mount Gay, which is next door, but Mount Gilbo, which was the original name of Mount Gay. And Mount Gilbo is recognizable by the outcrop of rock that you see on the left-hand side of the slide. The pond that you see in the foreground is actually the, the pond at Fairfield because Fairfield was next door to Mount Gilbo. And Mount Gilbo, of course, was a part of what we now know of Mount Gay, as Mount Gay. The experience of the wards and Mount Gay Rum shows that product diversification, careful, timely planning, and good marketing strategies can create a prosperous business even throughout a period of global or regional economic hardships. The story of Mount Gay and Mount Gay Rum begins not as Mount Gay, but as I said just now, as Mount Gilbo. Mount Gilbo was a sugar estate in St. Lucie, the most northern parish of Barbados which existed from around the 1660s. The name of the sugar estate was taken from an outcrop of rock projecting from a terrace, which overlooks the St. Lucy Parish Church and the flat cane fields um, beyond. In 1667, a still was established on the property known as Mount Gilbo. And from this date, rum or rum bullion, as it was known then, was produced on the sugar estate in relatively small quantities, as it was in many sugar estates in Barbados at this time. In 1703, Mount Gilbo was given an official license to become a distillation company. This has been proven by the existence of a notarial act which gave the estate permission to distill rum. Mount Gilbo continued to produce rum and the official date of the beginning of production has been given as 1703. In 1721, William Sandiford became the owner of Mount Gilbo. He passed on, and in later years, his son mortgaged Mount Gilbo to a planter and businessman called John Sober. Sober, no pun intended, continued to produce rum on the Mount Gilbo estate. 
1787, the Sober family gave Sir John Gay Aline, a close family friend, power of attorney over the Sugar Estate and asked him to manage it for them. Sir John was an excellent manager. According to Sir Hilary Beckles, noted Barbadian historian, he was a popular leader among the clan for elite, a speaker of the House of Assembly and was well respected in the community. After Sir John's death in 1801, the sober family, in gratitude for all the prosperity which Sir John's management had brought to their family, renamed Mount Gilbo Mount Gay after Sir John Gay Aline. And here you see a picture of the original Mount Gay plantation house. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like this anymore because just after Remy Martin bought out Mount Gay refinery and distillery, there was a fire and the house burned. So it's not there anymore. So this is a very special photograph. The Sober family then sold Mount Gay to Timothy Thornhill in 1860. Mount Gay continued to produce rum and from 1904 was compelled to sell the rum in demijohns of a minimum of 10 gallons. And you will see a photo of the demijohns later on. This meant that production had to increase. Next slide. Next. In 1919, Harriet, in 1919, after the eclipse at the South Pole, the small distillery at Mount Gay created Eclipse Rum. And this was done by A.F. Ward, and his signature was on the Mount Gay rum bottle. And this was inspired by that eclipse that occurred at the South Pole. This was the birth of the Mount Gay rum as we know it. Eclipse rum is still on the market today, 103 years later. What was happening in the world at this time, the early 20th century, and where were the wards? How did they come into the picture? Aubrey Fitzosbert Ward, next slide, was born in the month of May of 1869 to John and Margaret Ward, Lee Hutchinson, a middle-class white family who resided first at Seaview and then Penny Hole or Gemswit in St. Philip. Aubrey has six siblings, two sisters and four brothers, Alice, Florence, Ernest or Jim, John, Edmund and Bowen. Aubrey, Edmund, and the other brothers were educated at the village school in St. Philip. And after leaving school, Aubrey worked as a planter on other owners' estates in St. Philip, St. James, at Blowers, now known as Fort Vale, and in Christchurch at Cane Vale and Warners. Aubrey, or AF as he was known, was a hardworking, frugal visionary. One story about his boyhood is that as a boy, he raised turkey cocks, sold them, reinvested the money in more turkey cocks and made more money. And this was the beginning of his fortune. Aubrey and Edmund continued to work hard. And in 1908, the watershed year, Aubrey was, this is Edmund, Aubrey's brother. Aubrey was able to purchase Fairfield Chagreste and factory in St. Lucie from Dr. St. John. Aubrey moved from St. Philip to St. Lucie in 1908, bringing the first group of his many children with them. At this time, Aubrey had eight children and was 39 years old. By the time he died 40 years later, he had over 50 children, all of whom were provided for, even as adults, in his last will and testament. Aubrey ensured that he educated all of his children, most of whom attended the Alexandra School, the Parry School, which was the forerunner of Coleridge and Parry, and Harrison College. This at a time when a large number of children in the West Indies either did not go to school or went to school irregularly because their parents could not afford to send them and attending school was not compulsory. When AF bought Fairfield Estate in 1908, it was a small syrup factory and over the years he developed it into a full-scale sugar factory. My father, Roy Ward, next slide former patriarch of the Ward clan and is now deceased at almost 100 years of age, described to us as children how the factory chimney 
was constructed. The chimney is still standing in Fairfield Yard today. Daddy Roy also described how as a little boy of 10 years old, around 1926 it would have been, he helped to cut the stones which used, were used to build Harrison's Point Lighthouse. He said so, so I believe him, but at the time he would have been nine or 10 years old, but he said he helped to cut these stones. The story of the wards on Mount Gay Rum, and here's the lighthouse at Harrison's, still there. The story of the wards on Mount Gay Rum, even though concentrating on the St. Lucy wards, cannot leave out the Christchurch ward dynasty, which was founded by Aubrey's brother Edmund. At the same time that the St. Lucy wards were acquiring land, wealth, and prestige as an excellent business family in St. Lucy, the Christchurch branch of the family was doing a similar thing. In the north, F. Ward acquired the following sugar estates and properties. Fairfield Estate in 1908. Next slide. And this was the um, flagship estate. The house is being restored, but this photograph is of the house before the restoration started or occurred. He then bought Coconut Hall, also 1908, Mount Gay in 1918, Fairmount, next slide, Fairmount, Churchill, St. Lucy. This is Mount Gay again from a different angle. It was a beautiful plantation house. And this is Fairmount, Churchill, St. Lucy, which he bought the land and built this house in around 1918. He built this house so that he could overlook Fairfield factory. It has a wonderful view of the factory and lands beyond, and he could stand in the enclosed veranda and see all that was going on in his factory yard. The name of the house was coined from the ownership of the first two sizable sugar estates that AF bought, Fairfield and Mount Gay, hence the name Fairmount. AF lived here with six of his many children, their mother, Lillian Cadogan, had passed away while the children were still young, and he took those six and brought them up himself. My father, Roy, or Sir Roy, as the younger members of the family used to call him, was one of those six children brought up directly by A.F. Ward. The St. Lucy Wards also bought Harrison's, which we have seen before with the lighthouse, and that estate, and this is a part of the cliff of Harrison's, overlooking the sea. This estate was bought in conjunction with AF's brother Edmund and a brother-in-law, the husband of one of his sisters, Wallace Webster. Later, Aubrey paid out the other two part owners and took sole ownership of Harrison's plantation. He bought Oxford and St. Peter in 1924, Ashton Hall, St. Peter 1924, Cane Garden, St. Lucy 1926, Bentham, St. Lucy 1926, Barrows, St. Lucy, 1926, and in later years, Barrows House became the residence and office of the parochial doctor for St. Lucy. Trent, St. Lucy, 1932, Copeland, 1932, Broomfield, St. Lucy, 1944. This was also a small factory in the early years, and it is now where the family of Sir Charles, Charles Williams, Cow Williams, lives. Hannes, St. Lucy, 1945, bought at the end of the Second World War. This is where, for many years, Mount Gay Rum was stored in barrels for aging. This was before the move to Brandon's, next slide, St. Michael, where the barrels are stored today. The St. Lucy Wards continued to acquire sugar estates even after E.F. Ward died in 1948. Through a company established by E.F. Ward, Fairfield and Mount Gay Company Limited, the following proxies were obtained. Bourbon St. Lucy, 1950, Rock Hall St. Peter, 1956, Colleton St. Peter, 1980. Aubrey Ward established another company during his lifetime. Next slide. This was the Mount Gay Rum Refinery, known as the Refinery of Mount Gay Limited, which until comparatively recently was completely owned by the Wards. It is now owned by Remy Martin, as is the distillery. Mount Gay Sugar Estate is, however, still owned by the Ward family. While Aubrey was busy buying sugar estates in the north, his brothers Edmund and Jim were buying sugar estates in the south. Brother Jim 
bought Oldbury and Congo Road in St. Philip, Edmund bought Cane Vale, Warners, Adams Castle, Newton, Kingsland, Watton, and Maxwell and Christchurch. How was it possible for these brothers of humble beginnings to acquire so much land in a short space of time? Three factors played a part. The existing local and international economic situation of the time. This was the period leading up to the Great Depression of 1929 and the period during and immediately after the Depression. In addition, at the turn of the 20th century, from the late 1890s and into the early 1900s, sugar production in the British West Indies was in a slump. Plantation owners throughout the region had mountain debts which they could not pay. Many sugar estates in Barbados, British Guyana, Jamaica, and other British West Indian islands ended up in the court of chancery, which I explained before, where they had to be sold off cheaply in order for the owners to clear outstanding debts. The second factor was that through thrift and prudent financial management, the Ward brothers were able to take advantage of these relatively low land prices and buy up a lot of property. The third factor was that between Aubrey and Ad Edmund, they had a large number of children, almost 80 between them. These children all mentioned before, as mentioned before, were all well educated. Their mothers were all supported and given properties in which to live by Aubrey and Edmund, and neither of the men married any of the mothers or anyone else, but took care of them and their children very well. The children all worked in the family businesses. All the sugar estates were managed by their offspring. These managers and overseers therefore had a vested interest in ensuring that the sugar estates and the rum business were managed properly and that they made money. Those children who did not manage the estates or work in the Mount Gay rum business obtained professions and managed the factory as qualified engineers or became, as was the thing to do in that time period and still is, doctors and lawyers and still contributed in some way to looking after the family businesses. In addition, several of Aubrey and Edmund's children, like the royal families throughout the world, married their cousins. This was and still is perfectly legal and acceptable within secular and religious boundaries. These marriages, though based on love and respect, also helped to forge and strengthen the links between the Christchurch wards and the St. Lucy wards. Both sides of the family had shares in Mount Gairam and in each other's businesses. Even if not intended, these links also kept property and the family's fortunes within the white family unit, Mount Gay. How did Aubrey Ward happen to buy Mount Gay estate? As mentioned previously, Mount Gay ended up in the Court of Chancery in 1918, even though in former years it had been well managed by Sir John Gay Alley. Over the years, its fortune declined. A good friend and relative, Sam, encouraged Aubrey to take the risk and buy Mount Gay. Aubrey took Sam's advice and paid £33,000 from Mount Gay, which I think was still quite a lot of money for that time. You remember that Mount Gay was already distilling rum on a relatively small scale for a number of years. When Aubrey Ward bought Mount Gay, he introduced a different kind of still to Barbados. Next slide. This still was called the coffee after its inventor, Aeneas Coffee. This type of still aided in the increase in alcohol production at Mount Gay. What makes Mount Gay rum superior to all the other rums worldwide? It is the spring water from a natural well on the estate, which supplies unchlorinated water, which is used in the rum production. This water gives Mount Gay rum its mellow flavor. During the 20th century, Aubrey Ward's estate produced everything which was needed for the rum, in rum industry. The group of estates were self-sufficient. For example, the various sugar estates produced the sugar cane. The cane was harvested and then taken to the family-owned sugar factory Fairfield. And here you see one of the wheels that was used in the factory um, in grinding um, the sugar. Fairfield, where it was made into sugar. So first of all, they produced the sugar. The sugar was exported and molasses, its byproduct, was transported up the hill to Mount Gay 
to be used in the, produ in the production of rum. The bagasse or magas, which is the pith left after the cane has been crushed, was returned to the fields as mulch, and magas was also used on the estates as bedding for the chicken, cow, and oxen pens. It was used as fuel in the furnace of the factory, producing constant energy. Water from the pond, next slide, which we saw when we looked at um, Mount Gilbo, water from this pond was used to cool the massive engines in the factory. The mud, which was inevitably on the canes when they were harvested, were squeezed dry by rollers and returned to the cane fields as manure. Nothing was wasted. For most of the 20th century, Fairfield and Mount Gay Company Limited was self-sufficient in that it produced everything that was needed for the production of the alcohol, which was made into rum. In addition, Mount Gay also distilled the rum, blended it, bottled it, and together with its sister company, Mount Gay Distilleries, marketed the rum locally and internationally. This was a foolproof method for making and conserving wealth. Mount Gay and the Ward Enterprise did not always have an easy time though. Difficult times existed for the Caribbean sugar industry from the 1870s, around the same time that AF Ward was born, until the beginning of the First World War in 1914. Events such as competition from beet sugar in Europe, the entrance of new sugar producers to the world market like Mauritius, Java, Hawaii, led to a 25% drop in Caribbean sugar and rum exports to Britain. By 1914, the British Caribbean was selling only 125,000 tons of sugar to Britain, out of a total British consumption of 1.6 million tons. Life, therefore, became difficult for sugar and rum producers. Not for this, but even though times were difficult, Mount Gay and the Ward Holdings prospered as a result of prudent management and excellent marketing. Also, during the 1914-18 war and the Second World War, 39 to 45, the demand for sugar increased and businesses improved. In addition, rum was needed during the war for the soldiers, West Indian soldiers, as well as British soldiers, all the soldiers, rum was necessary because it eased the pain of the wounds which the, the soldiers encountered during war. So rum really did well, actually, during the two wars. The wars also forced Barbadians to buy local goods. Since threats of cargo ships being blown up en route to the Caribbean by U-boats used by the Germans made transportation of goods from Europe to the West Indies very difficult. In 1942, Mount Bay experienced its first major disaster when there was a fire at the distillery. The entire still was destroyed. Mount Gay ordered a new still from England, but the British government refused to release the copper for a new still because they needed copper themselves during the war. John F. Hudson, you remember him, the marketing manager, fought the British government until he succeeded in convincing them that the still was essential to the welfare of Barbados. The still was shipped from England, but there was the worry that it, the ship carrying it might be torpe torpedoed by the enemy U-boats. But here is the still. It arrived in Barbados in 1944, two years after it had been ordered. And there was a party at the Mount Gay office to celebrate the arrival of the still. All the Mount Gay personnel were relieved. Remember that Aubrey Ward had teamed up with John Hudson. Self-made man and John F. started a commission agency, was a born businessman, courageous with a talent for salesmanship. John F. went to Aubrey F. and offered to sell his rum for him under the name, the brand name, Mount Gay Rum. So it was the two of them, John F. Hudson and Aubrey, who gave Mount Gay Rum that brand name. John F. had one condition, though. He needed AF Ward to improve the quality of the rum. 
This was done, and John Hudson and A.F. Ward remained partners and friends for the rest of their lives until 1948. They were opposites in character. A.F. was a gentle, kind man. John Hudson was a dynamic action man, a fighter who refused to let any event distress him. In 1942, John F. and Aubrey Fitzosbury formed a private limited liability company called Montgay Distilleries. This company was separate and apart from Fairfield and Montgay Company Limited and was responsible for the blending, bottling, and marketing of Montgay rum. In the 1940s to the 80s, Montgay Distilleries was managed by one of F's sons, Darnley. Darnley was an excellent manager of the distribution sector. Velma Bourne, one of F's daughters, also worked in this sector of Montgay, based in the Montgay Distilleries building in Bridgetown for 40 years. At 90 years old, she is presently the oldest surviving child of AF Ward. There are five surviving children now. And bear in mind that Aubrey's first child was born around 1889. So here we are 133 years later, and he still has children who are alive. The two partners, AF and John F, went on to make Mulgairam a household national and international product. Just as cricket, Rihanna, and tourism have put Barbados on the map today. Mount Gay Rum brought recognition to Barbados in the first half of the 20th century. By 1950, Mount Gay Rum was sold in over 20 countries apart from Barbados. Today, it is being sold in 110 countries, including Australia and Japan. The ownership of Mount Gay Rum was as follows up to 1980. Ed Ward and his children, along with John Hudson and his children, owned Mount Gay Distilleries Limited, situated in Bridgetown. Aubrey and his children owned outright the rum refinery of Mount Gay, situated in St. Lucie, as well as the sugar estates previously mentioned, which came under the umbrella company called Fairfield and Mount Gay Company Limited. The Christchurch Wards under Edmund owned a company called Four Square Estates Limited, which controlled several estates in Christchurch and St. Philip, many of which were mentioned before. It can be seen that the Ward family owned a massive amount of land and up until the 1990s was the single largest owner of land in Barbados. The Wards collectively owned over 30 sugar plantations in the 20th century. What does this have to do with Mount Gairam? Next slide. A great deal. The sugar plantations and factories owned by the wards produced the molasses necessary for the production of rum, so there was no need to import molasses or buy from any other local producer. The ward syndicate was a self-sufficient unit. The production of Mount Gay rum in the early 20th century is much the same as it is today, with the exception of the fact that a new, next slide, continuous still is used in addition to the old pot still, which dates back to 1918 and is still in use. What makes Mount Gay Rum and the Ward family unique is the history, tradition, and the use of the special copper made double distill pot still used in production since 1918. In addition, it is the geology of Barbados and the chlorine-free water drawn from the well on the Mount Gay Sugar Estate, which creates the distinctive, popular flavor of this wonderful, unique rum. It is the fact that the product has grown and expanded internationally, bringing recognition to a small Caribbean island. With respect to the Ward family, it is the business acumen and vision of Aubrey Ward and the marketing skill of John F. Hudson, which led to the success of Mount Gay. This success is being sustained by the business acumen of Remy Martin, a French company which thinks so highly of Mount Gay Rum and the wards that they first bought into the company owning 49% of the shares of the marketing and distribution sector of Mount Gay Distilleries. Now they own the entire company. It is the fact that the Ward family is a large distinguished family, next slide. Not only are necessarily in wealth, but the family has produced a governor general, Sir Dayton Ward, several doctors, for example, Sir Frank Ward, who was a renowned surgeon, 
Dr. Louis Ward, who established the Obstetrics and Gynecological Department of the Christchurch Polyclinic. Dr. Eugene Ward, who was responsible for co-setting up the medical school at UWE, St. Augustine, Trinidad. Lawyers such as Sir Erskine Ward, who was a member of the federal parliament. Mrs. Evelyn ward Talma, a representative in the House of Assembly. Senators such as Mr. Lyle Ward and Mr. Roy Ward, who was also the agriculturist responsible for the reintroduction of sea island cotton to Barbados. Numerous teachers and sons and daughters in every occupational field imaginable in Barbados and beyond. Even after 103 years, the legacy and success of the Ward family and the companies which they own continue despite recessions, war and other challenges. Mount Gay Rum continues to be one of the oldest surviving businesses in Barbados. According to Dr. Henderson Carter, 100 years or more of successful operation for any company is an achievement that must be recognized and recorded. Mount Gay Rum and the Rum Refinery of Mount Gay remain a significant monument on the Barbadian landscape and a part of our Barbadian heritage, whether it is presently owned by Barbadians or not. The wars, however, were not only involved in agriculture and the production of Mount Gay Rum. Audrey F. Yeah, was one of the founding members of Plantations Limited, a company which in the early years of its existence gave credit to planters and sold lumber and hardware items to the public. Plantations Limited went on to acquire other businesses such as supermarkets, sugar estates before its demise in the late 1980s and 90s. He was also a founder member of the Barbados Foundry and F bought land at Sherman's in St. Peter, approximately where the fish pot restaurant is now and built a jetty where schooners, next slide, could come in to collect produce. He was instrumental in developing spikes down and owned a schooner which carried people stock, people stock and provisions from spikes down to Bridgetown where the vendors would sell their produce. Aubrey was the first planter to import a tractor through Charles McKenzie, a company which became known as Charles McInerney and is now known as ANSA. He also had shares in Port Royal Garage and investments in another garage called Fargo. He grew vegetables and exported sweet potatoes to Guyana. The companies associated with Mount Gay Rum have also provided employment for thousands of Barbadians. Mount Gay Rum also sponsors many sporting activities, especially sailing regattas, horse racing, etc. Mount Gay Rum is the preferred rum of sailors and yachts. The red caps with the Mount Gay logo are much sought after by those participating in regattas. The various companies earn much needed foreign exchange for Barbados and they keep the rum shops going. This is important in that, according to newspaper columnist and author Peter Laurie, the rum shop is one of the defining community institutions of the typical Barbadian village. The rum shop is a social club where patrons gather to share and argue ideas, especially politics, religion, cricket, and everyday happenings. It is a place where Barbadian men and women go to relax, and it is where one goes, men especially, after funerals to fire on for the deceased. The contribution of Mount Gay Rum in keeping the rum shop well stocked cannot be undervalued. The rum shop attracting its clientele also developed into the village shop, which provided most Barbadians with goods or groceries before the advent of the supermarket. Mount Gay Rum has also brought recognition to Barbados, next slide, by winning a number of international awards over the years, usually for the best rum, the most mellow. In honor of its beginnings, next slide, the Ward family has produced a spectacular rum, a new rum, sold internationally, not marketed by Remy Martin, which markets all of the other Mount Gay rums, but wholly and solely owned by the Ward family. This rum was produced to honor the beginning of Mount Gay Rum and the Ward Family Association with Rum. It is called Mount Gilbo. Unfortunately, Mount Gilbo is no longer produced and it has gone out of production. In conclusion then, the Ward Family and Mount Gay Rum are synonymous. 
They are an integral part of Barbados's heritage, a heritage which began in a humble way and has grown over the past hundred plus years into a heritage of international fame. Everyone has heard of Mount Gairam and the wards of Barbados. Thank you very much. And there are, you see in this last slide, these are the demijohns in the background with the basket work on. And that is what the rum was produced and sold in originally when it was only producing 10 gallon sections before it went on to being produced and aged in the barrels. And there is the original um, Mount Gay rum label with AF Ward signature on it. Some people tell me that they thought it was AY Ward, but remember in older English, the Y, the F was the Y was written the F was written like a like the Y that was it. The F was written like a Y, but it's AF Ward. Thank you again for allowing me to present to you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Linda. Uh, that's a lot of information on the Ward family and the development of Mount Gay Rum. We will now open for any comments or questions. We ask you to type your question in the Q&A. Uh, we have something here from Camille Boyne. So thank you for an invigorating presentation. You mentioned that the wars of at one point owned a significant amount of land in Barbados. How much of that land still belongs to the family? And is it still being used primarily for agricultural purposes? Okay, um, I think I can answer that. Quite a lot of the land is still owned by the wards, quite a lot of the sugar estates. Um, Almost all of them that I mentioned um, have been retained. However, all of the land is not used for agriculture anymore um, because, of course, agriculture, sugar, sugar particularly, has declined. And so um, some of the land has been sold off as um land for building, construction, etc. But quite a lot of those sugar estates, almost all of those sugar estates that were mentioned, that were mentioned, have been, um, are still retained. Places, some of them have been sold off. And of course, some of them you will recognize um, are now very important Historically, for example, Newton with Newton's burial ground, etc. So, um, but yes, I would say that most of the most of the sugar plantations are still retained. Those that are still in agriculture, um, the Barbie government, Barbados Agricultural Management, rents land from a lot of plantation owners actually, and they have rented a lot of land from the wards. Does that answer your question? I'm sure it does. Uh, a question from me, Linda. Has the story of the ward family in Mount Gay Rum, has that been documented in book form? Not yet on the way. Hopefully one day soon. It might happen, but I That's have started. Right. Okay, yes. okay. Well, we look forward to receiving that. Okay, here's another question. Uh, what happened to the Four Square Company owned by Edmund's family? Okay, the Four Square Company, I believe that the, some of the Christchurch wards still have shares in that, but quite a lot of those estates have been sold off. For example, if you look at Warner's, Warner's is now Tino Terrace, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at Adams Castle, Adams Castle is now Sheraton Park and Sheraton Mall, et cetera. So quite a lot of those have been sold off. Cane Vale, um, 
A lot of that land has been sold off as well for building. Maxwell as well, only um, even Maxwell Great House was sold off and unfortunately knocked down by the buyers, which is a pity because Maxwell House was lovely. And the buyers have started to years ago to build um, some to build something there, but they haven't gotten very far. They seem to have run out of money. I don't know what. Um, so Newton has become an industrial estate, more or less. So, but they do still own um, parts of the plantations. Thank you. There's a follow-up question from um, 059472. Is Four Square connected to Four Square Rum? No, it isn't. <laughs> no, it is not. Okay. Four Square Rum is with David Seal and so on. Four Square Estates is something different. Uh, another question from me, Linda. Um, it's such a long history. Um, the the archives of Mount Gay Estate and the Mount Gay Company has that been deposited? Is that available somewhere? Some of it. Some of it is available in the archives. Um, what should I say? There is, there are, as far as I know, some interesting information, which I'm not sure if the archives has, but when um, when the wards were moving from Mount Gay, when Remy bought Mount Gay, of course, you had to move all of your, when they bought Mount Gay House and, and a part of the yard, because Remy Martin does not own the whole of Mount Gay yard either. They only own the part with the bond houses and with the refinery and the plantation house. The rest of the Mount Gay yard, which has another house in it, etc., is still owned by the Ward family. However, when all of the things were moved from Mount Gay, I believe that there were some um, books and registers and so on that were removed as well. I understand that they are possibly um i haven't gone to look at them because i under the reason why i haven't gone is because i think that where they were put at that point in time maybe some vermin might have gotten in so in order to go through them you have to um you know be well prepared with gloves and different things, but there are some things there that I do plan to have a look at at some point in time. But there are there are quite a few things in the archives, and and they have um, in the plantation ledgers and so on. Information is there. Thanks, Linda. I know here at the museum we do have two of the ledgers okay. um, that were donated to the museum. But we look forward to an update when you go through those records. And I hope that will be soon because, you know, in this temperature. Yes. Uh, yes, right. So we won't, we won't want to lose that documentary history. True, true. So um, I just want to find out if anyone else wants to pose a question or comment to Linda. Remember, if you wish to speak on mic, you can just raise your hand and we will allow you to speak. Okay. Um, all right. So while we we'll give them a minute or so to make up their minds, Linda, is there anything else that you would like to persons to know about the Ward family and Mount Gayram that you have not mentioned in your presentation? Um, I can't really think of anything except to say that in a way, it is a pity that the wards no longer own Mount Gay Rum and the rum refinery of Mount Gay. And I think that that is a genuine loss to Barbados, a loss to the family, a loss to our heritage in the Caribbean, all of that. But it is what it is. <laughs> but no, that's it. Understood. Thank yeah. you so much. And 
Once again, I want to thank you, Linda, for taking us through this very interesting history of the Ward family and Mount Gay We look forward to the book. And we also look thank forward you. to um, seeing some more of those primary records that are, are now, that you will check and make okay. available yes. sometime in the future. I also want to thank those of you who took the time to be with us today. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, just remember that this session will was up, uh, recorded and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. You just have to go on and you'll be able to not only see or view this particular presentation, but many presentations uh, over the past that we have recorded and uploaded. So thank you again for being with us. Thank you, Linda. And I want to let you know that our next meeting will be in January, January 25th next year. Good. And I want to just let people know that next year, March next year will be our 10th anniversary. Uh, so if persons are interested in contributing to our Connections newsletter, or they're interested in sharing their stories, their family stories in our presentations, please make contact with me. So thank you all, and I wish you all the best for the festive season, and stay safe. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone, as well. Bye. Bye.